So I realize now that though this clearance is fine, if you rotate this thing fast enough, the centrifugal force will pull these rows out far enough to start hitting this guy. There you go. You kind of see it placing to a larger radius. They're probably not supposed to do this anyways. So I had noticed that this row here had somehow gotten warped. And I should be able to unbend it. better. Or basically, yep, fixed. Now I also need to figure out why the resistance is greater over here than over here. Also, as far as I can tell, this machine does not have any margin release mechanism. This here is our absolute margin stop. So if you hit here, hit your tab, Be contacting the outside. Then over here, you will realize that it actually slots over in order to clear the tab, so you basically only get a belt trip. So there's no line lock. seemingly endless dirt on this platen. One last thing to note is the carriage lock mechanism here. So basically you just lift that up and that would both raise a pin for the carriage and also lock the drum in place. So, you know, there's a corresponding slot there. And likewise, if I can find the correctly centered, there you go. So that's a fully centered orientation. Though, I would technically consider that pin weak, at least in the shipping context. It's all good. Okay, at last this machine is effectively finished. I have my margin set. It feeds pretty well. And I've already finished cleaning the machine. So, yep, basically the whole idea behind this machine is that it is a massive index typewriter. So an index typewriter can be characterized by number one, sometimes, well at least eventually they start including backspaces, then you have a spacebar mechanism, then you have an impression key. And that's here as my only other example of a index typewriter, the Mignon, which I mentioned earlier in this video. So backspace bar impression, and instead of using a knob and rotating a massive drum, use 
well, this kind of knob. And you point directly. No, okay, yeah, this is just a custom fractor key legend I made to match this typeface I have. This guy cost money. <laughs> and then it will index itself using similar pins, as you can see. And it also has a rotational index here. So again, yeah. you can check the video card up here for a much more in-depth video on the Mignon. Uh, I'm saying Mignon because I believe that should be the German way as opposed to French way of saying it. Not Mignon. <laughs> Mignon. I believe. <laughs> so, same principle. Now, we have this guy smeared across a whole drum. And we can select. So, I have no clue what this character is, but... Now, that printed it, right there. Let's start here. Oops. Mm. So, now, let's say I want to select this character, because it looks cool. And, it just printed right there. Though I'm curious as to... I guess it only prints the lower one, and then that upper symbol is denoting something. I'll find out soon. <laughs> um, another interesting thing is... Okay, wait, so let's see if these... So these here were intentionally left blank. So if I do this guy, yep, it is correct. So that was. that guy. So I suppose they did... Oh wait, okay, so there's a bunch of missing slugs there. Hmm. Well, that is true. Currently there's nothing here, unfortunately. Sky. Okay, that printed. Nothing here. Yep. That one printed. Oh, and I guess you do have to make sure that you press it hard enough for the escapement to actuate. Now, I still don't know what's up with this resistance, but right now I'm going to assume that maybe it is kind of intentional, as it basically forces a kind of tactile drop that encourages you to press with equal hardness. Pretty loud. And then we have our double spacing. As you can see. Now, for this row, interestingly, there's no legend for this guy. I don't know if it fell off, but it does print a character. <laughs> so maybe, I don't know if that would actually, I mean, I could just go ahead and stick that into so yeah, already we know that these... What the heck was that? 
I hope that wasn't anything important. But yeah, basically, you're hammering to nothing. So maybe I would be able to transfer some slugs from there to there, as well as to here. And then maybe customize some inserts. Mm, anything special? Mathematical keys. Circle. Tilde. So there are still some missing slugs. And of course we have our English characters. Oh. Oh dear. Right. Oh dear, that alignment is abysmal. Okay, I think you do have to make sure not to press this too quickly. Okay, I can see now why I probably do want to get rid of that resistance. P and let's check the caps alignment. There's H, then lowercase h. I'd say it's pretty good. Imagine if this were a drum of DRAMs. You can actually see the rows dropping into the or to contact the outer ring one by one. And the opposite onto this end. Right. So when you use the single spacing, or this spacing here, the characters end up too close together. So, rather, you want that kind of spacing, while well, this guy is only supposed to be used with the English characters. So I was wondering what this slot was for, but then I realized obviously it's just to allow you to actually be able to remove this side panel. Okay, so I went ahead and removed these side panels from this drum assembly, or I guess you could call it drum carriage. Um, so here you can see the line centering or row alignment mechanism. More clearly, as well as how that bell crank, or well, that bail, interacts with this link, which finally lifts the character, like so. Now, one thing that I realized was that this guy here was loose, or it was technically sticking out like that, such that this can move in, but... And looking at the other side, unfortunately, the adjustment nut is completely missing. 
And the same is true of the other side. How that happened, I have no clue. Hmm. If this fits, I'll be delighted. <laughs> it's like, I don't need that. Well, thank goodness. Absolutely fantastic. So basically now, in addition to removing these panels to clean a bit deeper within the machine, I'm hunting for nuts. <laughs> Maybe I could use that. Um, and of course you saw how this guy slotted neatly around that paper release. And likewise, this guy will slot nicely. Okay, so yeah, basically I had to remove those two screws to basically lower this bar out. And technically I don't think I actually had to do that. I just needed an appropriate tool in order to pop this guy out since it seems like it's designed to snap back on. Anyways, so there's your paper release. Simple design that pushes these rockers down. Now I find this guy interesting, how this spring is looped around like that. I guess it helps pull it down, or like provide a downward tension. Yeah, it's a very simple bale design for the carriage release. Um, you can't really see much more of the escapement from this perspective. Yeah, the, the escapement dogs are still hidden from view. This side, you can see the... So... And we have that... Knob here. Oh, I see now. Okay. It's basically just... a guide controlling how far or at what point that Paul descends into that ratchet. And, okay, yeah, so two settings here for the detent, that guy, and then gets pulled out of the way well pushed by cam. So the nuts I'm considering are these ones on either side. And as far as I can tell, their only purpose is to help secure that depth thing stop for the Carriage release. So it is indeed the right size. Just I'm not sure about the long term effects of leaving that guy loose. Okay, so as far as I can tell, this is not an eccentric. Which is to say that it can't be used to adjust the depth thing of the carriage rack here with the escape and pinion. And even then, I can't really see any other ways to adjust it. Um, given that you only have a side to side adjustment there. Wait, unless that slot is actually. Uh, no, it might be an illusion that the slot is slanted. 
but as far as I can tell, the machine operates fine without it. I suppose another way to judge the concentricity is to just roll this thing around a flat surface and you can see that neither end wobbles. So I was considering trying to use this nut over here since it's technically not really needed since the right side already provides a sufficient retainer. But at this point I just figured out it's already 1.30 a.m. so I might as well just um, head to Home Depot tomorrow and get some proper replacements. As for the carriageway adjustment, I realize now that there's also these screws for if you ever need to remove this rail. And I already showed the lower screws for removing the front rail. Um, then for the lower rails, there's actually screws that you can access by these holes. Now the issue is it seems like this typewriter was really machined such that the carriageways have permanent alignment. Um, as in, they go into these slots, they fit snugly, and after that their position is set forever. <laughs> Um, given that, currently what I consider to be the suspect for that resistance at this point would be the middle implementation of, or instance of, these retainers here. So if I'm at this point, I get about this much play, but if I'm at this point, here. I barely get any play at all. So something is tightening up, and I'm not sure what. And theoretically, it shouldn't be possible for it to be a problem with these carriageways, since their alignment should be permanent. Satisfying. And yeah, as you can see, I figured to go ahead and remove all of the slugs. Last time I only did just half of them. So now you can see that. I'm going to finish the cleaning job here. Now, one detail is you'll see here that there's barely any wobble in that spoked wheel. Well, here, you do see a decent bit more wobble. So I'm wondering if that wobble might have anything to do with why it's a case that only specific parts of the, or only a certain range of rows, has a high resistance when trying to make an impression, while the rest are for the most part reasonably smooth, other than of course the actual inertia of the mechanism. So maybe if I try pressing to fix that, eccentricity, then that might help improve it. Otherwise I'll have to go here and go at this set screw in order to adjust the phase, or basically the alignment of these slots with what I'm calling the lift guide. Okay, I think I have it running about as true as on the left side now. It's much less wobble. So there's some nice bearings. Looking closer, you should be able to see the anti-creep mechanism. So that edge over there, 
that is part of what's called a cage that holds the ball bearings, or at least whatever implementation this machine uses, likely ball bearings, and keeps them centered such that the load distribution is always optimal, or at least close to such, and balanced. Otherwise, yeah, just bad things will happen. Now, as for that resistance, I'm suspecting that it should indeed likely be due to, yeah, there, you can see, kind of, it's probably rubbing. So I'm going to need to remove this alignment bar, partly so I can clean it, and then try to lift this retainer up a bit. That alignment bar can be removed via these screws. So it turns out that you can actually remove the spools by removing this clip here. So that guy would have... Okay, I'm guessing it would have stuck in like that. I'm not sure if it would actually interface with that hole, but... Probably would have. But yeah, it would stick into there. That would couple it to the spring here. So there's a main spring in there with the same kind of overwinding protection. You can hear that sliding. As you find in the actual main spring. So that basically allows a nice, relatively constant tension to be kept on the carbon ribbon, regardless of how wound it is, or, like, I guess obviously I was wondering how it would be possible for this to rotate and provide tension for such, for so much ribbon, but of course it's just because it slides when it needs to. And then, yeah, on the other side, you would go ahead and guess you can maybe there are better tools technically what I did was I was trying to hold it like this and then unscrew and then that ended up causing this clip to pop out anyways the reason I'm doing this is because I want to eventually renew regain access to all this ribbon which I didn't use um, because I was operating this mechanism so many times without actually printing anything. So here we have all the slugs facing up. You can see how a few of these rows have missing slugs. Um, of course this one kind of expected to be missing since those are optional. Um, and there are also cases where there's a slug present but it doesn't match the legend, or the legend is missing. So for example, over here, we have some blank spots. And you can one, two, three, four, five, four. You can just match the number 36 to 36, and you'll see that there are, in fact, corresponding characters. So in that regard, maybe they were taped on at some point, and then they just fell off. Likewise, it seems like, I think, yeah, here, for example, um, there's a character, so 16, 16. Yeah, that's a case where there's actually no slug, and it's still a legend, so I don't know if we were ever supposed to have that character, or technically... There is a place, yeah, it should be here. Okay, so it's located there instead. But for some reason, there's still this. Or maybe they moved the slug to this row because they found it more convenient that way. And also, if you actually look at these, some of these look quite clean, while others are fairly blackened from carbon residue. So that probably gives you an idea of which ones are more common than the other. 
Then here are your hiragana and katakana, as well as your English slugs. Okay, we can now go ahead and go at these nuts with a 364th inch wrench. And see if we can lift these a bit higher. Nothing yet to get the other one, which will be a bit harder to reach, though you can go easily push the this bale out of the way. So, a 5mm wrench ended up fitting better. Well, I didn't have to touch these guys, but long last. Lovely. Um, so I guess I'll go ahead and maybe loosen the rest. Make sure that they're resting just lightly while it's still able to slide this smoothly, then I'll tighten them. So all the other bolts were able to be accepted by this 5.5mm wrench reasonably well. For some reason these two, um, maybe they were just too worn or they were machined a bit differently. Such that, well, I guess it's, it was already high enough, but yeah, I'm gonna have some trouble loosening this without actually having the space to fit in a slot head. I suppose the slant here basically helps make the design self-aligning. So basically initially it will be able to shake around, but then it will automatically position itself as you tighten. Now when reinserting the right bolt and eccentric here, do note that at least in my machine there was actually a washer here to fill that gap, and there is no such gap on the other side, so there is no washer needed. Okay, so you can also now, this position, better see the operation of that alignment tab. So let's say that's a bit off, then it will lock into place. Wait a minute. Hmm. You actually do kind of get a different view here. Okay, so you can see that for English spacing, that guy there moves less compared to in this little kanji spacing. Then you can see that they were there for the vibrator, class 2. Okay, it's time to get all these bars back into this machine. So I'm going to use that hole in the slotted wheel as my reference for number 1, whereby I want 36 to go over here. A third of the way through. Wonderful. Now you can nicely and smoothly select whatever uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, the point is that like earlier, there was way too much friction for you to be able to easily 
slew to a single character. So if you're wondering what these red marks are for, consider these holes in the panels. Those will basically tell you which legend corresponds with a current slug or bar of slugs you are pulling out. So fixing that eccentricity issue unfortunately didn't fix the issue with a number of these bars having a lot of resistance to be lifted. So I'm going to now resort to that set screw adjustment and try to tweak the phase of this star wheel so that there won't be any interference when they are being introduced into this lift guide. So if the alignment star wheel is causing the rows flanking tabs to be introduced to the lift guide such that it interferes with the rear surface. And that means that when I loosen this, assuming that this guy stays stationary, I want to be able to slightly shift this guy this way. Or if this is stationary, I want to shift the star wheel clockwise. I suppose one thing you can do is hold down the impression key partially just so that the alignment star wheel is kept in a stationary position and the position that you expect once or while you're actually pressing a key, then you can actually shift this guy back and forth while watching that tab and trying to center it such that it enters the lift guide with minimal resistance. And at that point you can tighten it. So annoyingly there's actually some kind of like flat surfaces inside there preventing me from probably ret returning this and also making it difficult to dial in a fine adjustment since um, the, the set screw would actually be end up facing the inner surface at an angle rather than at a tangent or well normal or radius. That holy shit moment once you finally dial everything in right and it's just nice and smooth for like the grand majority of the bars, except for like just four, like these guys, for whatever reason decided to be stubborn. But everything else is for the most part pretty smooth. Yeah, the tolerances are crazy. So that one is tight. This one isn't that tight. Or I guess maybe this marks the peak of where the issues are. So maybe, hopefully, one more tiny adjustment will finally fix it. Or make it worse. Okay, so you can see now that with both spools unlinked and free to turn, I can now go ahead and unwind the ribbon to restore those parts which are actually still good to use. Okay, so up to m the point of my receipt of this machine, it does seem like the ribbon had indeed seen some fairly legitimate use. And I guess, yeah, of course, the most wear that occurred was back when the machine had finally come into disuse and this ribbon got unlinked from the ribbon vibrator. So in that case, I'm going to start winding this guy back until the very start of the good point of the ribbon. And again, for putting the spools back on, you have to first seat them into those two tabs 
into two of the three slots. Then for the last slot, um, you would have to stick this clip in. That the end of that clip will fit into a hole, and you can just press it in, maybe with the help of a tool. Okay, so if I tweak the machine in this direction, oh, now it's a hard stop. Hmm. I wonder what that could be. But I'm hoping that it doesn't have anything to do with the adjustments that I made to those middle retainers. Right, you can actually get a better view, another good view of the escapement here. At least particularly the this rocker. So there's a tab was a part that lifts up. Well, if you can see the escaping pin. Part of the escape wheel, I believe. So I went ahead and removed those bars again, and finally was able to locate the cause of that knocking sound. Indeed it is a retainer, fortunately not these middle ones, um, yeah, hitting the inside of the frame, and indeed if you twist the carriage like this in this motion, that brings that part of the frame lower, causing it to eventually catch. So in that case I just have to lower it just a tiny bit while still allowing enough play for nice and smooth motion. Okay, so now there's plenty of clearance. No more knocking. Now, while the bearings do have a cage, so again, you can see the front, the left edge over there, and then the right edge. Maybe, well, at least you would know that it would have to be at least this wide. Well, at most this wide. <laughs> um, but yeah, since... Yeah, it really seems impossible for there to be any threads in the ways. I've also looked under. I don't see any threading. So, probably is purely relying on the collision of those bearing cages with these screws to correct any 
what's called cage creep, where the bearing basically slides within the ways. Um, I might be able to induce some creep if I push it. Let me see. Okay, so if I insert that truncated nail to block the bearing cage, you'll be able to hear that it is being slid to the right. So now when I get here, there's now some resistance due to the misalignment, or due to it trying to be Yeah, in this case, I'm guessing it's colliding with the with the this screw here now, since it's too far to the right. And in this case, fortunately, it's quite easy to undo that just by moving this and pulling it all the way to the left, where it seems to be easier to slide it back. So now it's smooth again. Also here, you can see that compared to the previous or earlier Toshiba models, they would have used paper inserts, I believe, under a plastic or cellulose cover. This machine uses, basically prints the legends onto what I believe to be a kind of foil-like material, which is then laminated onto the actual substrate here. And of course you can see that there are a bunch of dents from whatever things might have impacted the drum and its bars, for whatever the reason. And assuming that material and the fact that it's not paper, um, I should be able to safely clean up these marks and have this machine looking a bit cleaner. So I went at this tape mark with some goo gone. Um, and yeah, even with a lot of abrasive force from some cotton swabs, that's about as good as it gets, unfortunately. And likewise, it seems like that same substance, or similar substance, that made its way here, as well as a bunch of different areas. I don't think it's rust, per se. Um, I was able to rub it out in different areas, but yeah, like this stuff inside the machine is much harder to deal with or is bound a lot more strongly um, so yeah like this part here did chip off but the rest is staying on pretty toughly and the legends themselves are already also pretty tough which is nice um, you can kind of, well, at least in person, you can see a bit of the 3D contour of whatever printing method they used. Different layers, like the lines, the white lines, have a bit of a thickness to them. Same thing with the characters themselves. Not as easy to see in this lighting. So, given that, probably the best I can do is just do a simple wipe down with a light detergent just to clean off whatever dirt and maybe hopefully allow these legends to pop a bit better. Actually, it seems like some simple green diluted is able to do the trick. And as far as I can tell, Fortunately, it has no effect on the actual pigments underneath. That's nice. So, you can kind of see a slight br increase in brightness after cleaning off that thin layer of dirt.
Okay. All done. Much cleaner now. Lovely. Um, a bunch of these custom legends seem like they're sealed with the same adhesive that they use to stick them on, though some of these, which may have been put on at different times, if not by different people or different owners, are still exposed, so I had to be a bit more careful around them. I think, like here, I might have accidentally caused a bit of fading. Oops. It just fell and bent. <laughs> Now, for the situation where we're hitting the slug a bit to the left, and it will even still end up a little too far to the left when it's fully pressed, um, you can either loosen the screw and try to turn this, or you can keep this straight, and I guess you should be able to adjust the left and right position slightly of the alignment comb itself. Okay, so first I loosen the screw and turn this a bit clockwise. And for those keen of eye, you would notice that, yeah, unfortunately, that line there, or those lines are no longer perfectly parallel, um, but, I mean, I can't really do any adjustments at this end or attempt to bend this entire cast piece. And yeah, this is hardened metal, so can't really change anything there. And then after loosening the index or the alignment comb, um, with it stationary, I moved the machine as far to the left as possible, then tightened. So now it's protruding a bit. Like so. And now we have reasonably centered strikes, as you can see. Okay, so I had to take a short detour from working on this machine in order to repair this machine, which had arrived yesterday. Um, so, otherwise, today, I was finally able to go to Home Depot and obtain appropriate replacement nuts. So, in this case, turns out that they are M4, or 4mm nuts. To just take this guy as an example. Threads nicely. Okay, so that means that I should be able to tighten these and do the proper eccentric adjustment for these two sides. Okay, so given that, You'll not be able to see how you're able to apply that eccentric lift and shift around that lever and this lever. So if you look over here, you might be able to see the tab that it needs to contact. Okay, so on this side it actually isn't really possible to get it to contact perfectly. So that's where it's at the highest. And on this side. It 
Seems like there might be a bit more play. Unless it's already contacting, I doubt it. But the point is I'm trying to first balance it so that it's just about to touch. But without causing any interference. Like if I, yeah, like here, it would, if we're resting too high, then it would prevent rotation of the drum. Okay, so even after setting those eccentrics such that the two lifting arms are balanced and contact the side tabs of the respective bar simultaneously, um, basically didn't really get much of an improvement compared to before that adjustment, um, other than that now, of course, with those nuts replaced and secured, the results should remain consistent throughout the rest of this machine's life. Um, so, yeah, pretty much like when this, 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 and this, as well as a few, like number 11, I think also 17, will still have a bit of resistance, like if you're doing a slow press, compared to a really nice and smooth one like 19 and a bunch of others. But what matters is that during an actual full force press, um, that basically nothing really sticks out and everything is reasonably fluid and yeah, everything just works. So, yeah, given that, that's about as good as I can adjust it and it's about time to finish cleaning the remaining panels and to put things back together and do some actual typing.